First Nations. I'm grateful to be here and speaking to you all. I'm grateful to the organizing committee, to Professor Reem for inviting me here. And you know, over the past um, couple of days, I've learned a lot from all of you, uh, from you know, community organizers, um, activists, scholars. Um, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. Uh, and my co-panelists, I'm just really grateful to be here with all of you. Um, so why am I here and, and what I want to talk to you about, and I, I will, you know, there's a lot to say, but I will link it always to law because we are here, um, national security and, and Windsor law, um, and my experience with systemic racism at the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. Um, I'm proud to say that um, for the first time in its history uh, of CSIS, um, I was able to get them to admit that systemic racism is part of the culture um, in that organization. Um, and I'll tell you how exactly um, that came to be, um, but first, uh, a, few, a few things to, to mention. Um, so I worked in national security for 18 years. Uh, I held top secret clearance, NATO clearance at the highest level. Um, and while at CSIS, I was seconded to our integrated threat assessment center uh, at the communication security establishment, which is uh, our equivalent to NSA, and uh, worked in security screening and worked as well at the Canada Border Service Agency uh, as a senior national security advisor. So a, a wide and deep understanding of our national security uh, practices, uh, policies, and what goes on behind the scenes, which is something really exclusive and really not, not in the public realm uh, in any way. Um, and so, and, and my goal in, in writing my book, and, and uh, my book will be published by McGill Queen University Press in April of 2023, is to con continue the resistance uh, and to uh, to keep the conversation going and the interest. And I think stories are the best way to share that kind of knowledge um, because stories resonate as opposed to, you know, wrongdoings here and there that, that don't connect in, in any way. Um, so that's, that's why I wrote my book. Now, um, you know, and it's important to continue that conversation about CSIS because CSIS is a, is a critical organization in the government of Canada. We have, you know, any federal government employee that wants to work at any embassy or global affairs, national defense, um, gets vetted by CSIS. CSIS has a say in terms of who are going to be the decision makers in this country in terms of our foreign policy. Um, CSIS uh, establishes uh, who comes in as a refugee immigration policy. Um, and we see the inconsistencies in those decisions um, that are racialized in terms of, you know, Ukrainian nationals not being seen as a security threat, not going through the same refugee clearance process as any other refugees, right? And so um, it's, it's a critical organization. And, and, and obviously the disregard to human rights um, and duty of condor and, and all of these issues that are surfacing you know, through courts, uh, not oversight bodies, and, and that's a problem, right? Um, and so it's important to continue to talk about CSIS. Now, um, in terms of, you know, there are debates about whether you want to change from the inside or the outside, but I think it's important that we have people on the inside that do this work because of just how closed off it is to the public. Um, and, you know, hopefully, uh, what I'm doing inspires other, others to do the same. Um, now, historically, these organizations have, have been closed off. Like we have a book by a Canadian author that was um, embedded into GCHQ, which is um, the British equivalent to NSA. And he wrote a book and, and you know, showed how for 30 years there was a color bar in the, in the UK establishment in getting minorities into uh, sensitive sectors. And you know, given our historical links to the UK, this was the same case in Canada. So racialized communities have, will, have always been prevented from entry into national security work. And um, you know, only uh, an example is at CSIS, the first uh, women as intelligence officers was in 1985. 
And in terms of racialized minorities, this was in 2000. And, you know, I reckon that this happened because of the Employment Equity Act um, and the Employment Equity Act in 1996, you know, there was an amendment requiring that the Canadian Human Rights Commission conduct audits. And the audit was coming in, uh, you know, three years from, from 96, it was going to happen around 1999. And lo and behold, the first, you know, black <laughs> officer was hired at CSIS in 1999 and I followed in year 2000. And so that, that's, that was the entry because there was a legal requirement and you know, greater accountability on the organization. Um, and, um, and so this, this was the entry point. And so I found myself in an institution that was all white, all male, uh, pretty much at decision-making. Uh, given that women had just entered in 85, they had not made it up to um, in, in those roles. And obviously, given the links between the RCMP and CSIS, uh, you know, former uh, Mounties were um, the decision makers at CSIS and held ex executive positions. Um, and so, you know, and I, and I, because of all the legal uh, minds that we have here, you know, I'm so critical of the employment equity in the, the Canadian Human Rights Commission processes, um, which, you know, doesn't look at um, intersectionality, for example, or quotas in terms of, you know, is there, is there that entry and, and so on. And that's something that the Black Class Action Lawsuit is, is now fighting and trying to um, have that, those changes um, occur, but um, as well, I, I, I'd be uh, remiss to not mention the, um, you know, the, um, the fact that during the Cold War, uh, members of the LGBTQ community were also, you know, um, treated in similar to, you know, the, what Muslims were treated like after 911, um, you know, violently purged from government, from any decision making. Um, and um, um, there's a lot uh, reported on that as well. And, and there was a public apology in 2017. Um, and, you know, the fear still continues within the Muslim community. There was that purge, but, you know, there's a lot in terms of people coming out and, and saying, this happened to me um, and seeing just the numbers. And of course, given the lack of transparency in the organization, those numbers aren't gonna come from the inside. Um, there needs to be that, uh, um, that happening. Um, in terms of my experience, uh, I got in, you know, I did all my polygraph examinations and security clearance and everything before 911. And it's interesting how I was never asked about my religiosity going in uh, to the organization. Um, you know, but I was asked, and, and at the time that was, you know, the concern about uh, a few protests that I attended in support of Palestinian rights. Um, and so that was, um, that was uh, those are the kind of questions I was asked. Uh, however, I did my first polygraph, you know, polygraphs can be inconclusive, deceptive, or, um, or um, uh, uh, valid, and mine was inconclusive. And the reason it was inconclusive was because the questions that were posed were for um, white males. You know, if you have any travel experience, have visited embassies and whatnot, you, you would, you, that's the reason it was inconclusive. So there were systemic barriers even to get in. And every racialized member of the national security right now, everyone has a story in terms of entry and, and, and you know, the different, um, the different uh, challenges that, that, uh, that, are in, that were in front of them. Now inside CSIS, um, you know, that's a, we're limited in terms of time, but you, you will read in my book, you know, there was uh, a roller coaster of, you know, uh, of, um, um, uh, how can I say, inclusion, exclusion, <laughs> and um, uh, many, many, many challenges, right? But I want to highlight uh, that I was, inspired by a number of people, and these were American national security um, officials. One of them is James Lee. Excuse me, just one sec. So one of them is James Lee, and he was um, a Muslim chaplain who served at Guantanamo Bay right when it started. 
And within um, 10 months of him expressing some of the wrongdoing, he was imprisoned and he was threatened with the death penalty and held in solitary confinement. And you know, not, not too many people know about that kind of resistance that was going on. And he, he wrote a book about that experience uh, following um, his release. Um, and there's Ali Soufan as well, who is a Lebanese American, a former FBI agent who spoke against interrogation techniques and um, had to, uh, was forced out really of the FBI, um, given his uh, revealing the torture that was happening um, at the CIA. And so, um, oh, five minutes. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of the lawsuit and why we decide, how we launched it is, you know, I, we requested ATIP. Um, I had much information um, that demonstrated the systemic racism that I experienced. And we went to an MP, an MP um, spoke to the fact that we need to demonstrate that this is a systemic issue. And so we got a group of us together. There was myself, the first uh, um, black intelligence officer, um, a gay man whose partner was Muslim. And uh, you know he experienced both, both types of racism as well as two other Muslim officers. And so the three of us decided to go this route together and go public because we could not uh, affect change within the organization. And you know we had in, tried internal mechanisms here and there nothing worked in fact the um uh one of one of the five had already it was established through a third party investigation that discrimination did occur but nobody was punished and that goes to alex's point where internally um there's never any kind of um uh you know active measures to ensure that these things don't happen and and um and so on so uh, we went, uh, we threatened, we went to one of the most reputable labor law firms in Toronto and wrote a very aggressive letter expressing that we were going to the media and we will be uh, calling for a public inquiry. Um, and, and that shook things up and we named names over 20 uh, executive managers at CSIS um, and, and, and the treatment that we uh, received, which you know, a lot of it was out in the media. This really shook things up for CSIS. And you know, they called in all the managers from across. Some of them were in you know, Montreal or BC and whatnot. Um, and we, were, uh, we received a reply back saying, come back, we will investigate. We will not hold the, there's a, a, a one year uh, policy. You have to report any kind of discriminatory behavior. Um, uh, you know, you, the, the one year expires. And so they said, we will open that up. Um, and uh, we want to resolve this in, in some way, shape or form. And we will be hiring a third party investigator to look into your specific allegations, but also systemic racism within the Toronto region. Um, so we were, we were hopeful that this, all of this would occur. Um, however, when we looked at the mandate letter of the investigators of the third party investigator, it was that this was not an official complaint, that the, the results would not be shared with us. Um, and so, you know, the trust, you know, that was already very weak <laughs> was broken. Um, and we decided, and, and the other issue was our lawyers, when they saw that there wasn't going to be a settlement, decided to abandon us. <laughs> and so we went to, we went to a lawyer who, you know, fought for residential schools. <laughs> Uh, against residential school uh, schools, we went for a lawyer that represented Omar Carter, uh, a lawyer that knows the Department of Justice and uh, would be willing to uh, to support us. And and this was John Kingman Phillips, who's an amazing, amazing Toronto lawyer uh, and an incredible lawyer by the name of John uh, uh, Laura Young, who represented an RCMP officer, Peter Merrifield. And uh, you know, won won his lawsuit to unionize the RCMP. Um, and while we were doing this, there there were appeals happening um, on on the Merrifield case, which impacted kind of our decision making uh, later on. Um, okay, so um, so we went through this process and um, and and spoke to media, and this was you know completely against anything that I was prepared initially to do is, you know, the, the worst thing that an intelligence officer can do. And the one thing that you're polygraphed on and the one thing that you're always, look, they're looking at you not to do is speak to media. 
And so, you know, but, but we did. Uh, it was myself and Alex, the others um, didn't feel comfortable. We went and spoke with Michelle Shepard, again, somebody who, you know, we knew was uh, very aware of the security and intelligence world and um, uh, would provide, you know, honest reporting on this. Um, and so through media, through as well the NDP, and, and that's why I'm indebted to the NDP, through the national security critic, uh, Matthew Dubé, who I was speaking to because my colleagues were in, in, in Toronto, we uh, were able to uh, mount pressure on the government uh, at the House of Commons where questions were being, uh, um, uh, where, where the issue was being raised as well as uh, publicly in the media, and there were comments by the prime minister. And, um, and then a docu uh, the climate assessment report out of Toronto, um, they were keeping, the, the, the assessments were concluded, but they were keeping it um, uh, until after our case makes it, makes it through the courts. Um, there was an offer of mediation, um, the first mediation, um, and, and both of them were led by a former Supreme Court uh, judge, and he saw the evidence. He saw um, um, he saw all of it, and um, and so, you know, the climate assessment report. They were hiding it from him as well. He got very upset at the fact that this was the case, and and released it to us. Um, and so there was, you know, an understanding uh, on, on CSIS's part that we were going to release it, given the fact that we've been so bold about, about the situation and we're releasing this to the media. And so they, they beat us to it and, and released it. And, and so now for the first time, we have a record of what is going on at CSIS and what that document says is that, you know, there's a lack of trust in managerial decision making, that there is, you know, an atmosphere that is very toxic and that, you know, um, racialized um individuals that are working within that institution are you know um suffering from discrimination and harassment as well as conversations that are happening on individuals that are being investigated by the organization and so a very you know um uh, no wonder we have all these uh failures that are you know uh in the public realm in terms of how CSIS conducts its investigations and all the brave mca msa and other students and everyone else that's coming forward and saying this has been my experience with national security providers um and so um i'm, I'm out of time but you know um that experience taught me as well a lot about the law and um, I was really disheartened by it. <laughs> I know you're all lawyers and this is difficult to hear, but it was disheartening because I, after doing all of that, I wanted it to go through the courts. And yet we have these settlements that, you know, um, give, uh, and to Alex's point, give uh, the wrongdoers protection um, and, 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 you know, make change that much harder. Right, and so, but the system itself is set up for these types of settlements, and you know, pr provided like you know to a Supreme Court judge all the evidence that we had, and we had plenty, um, as well as and, and my colleague Al Alex, who was you know a, a trailblazer, just walked out with document after document, risking the fact that you know he could be charged under the Information Security Act, right? Um, with all of that, we were not. A able to convince our lawyers or the judge that this was worth going through and unfortunately you know when i see there is another muslim officer that has sued the service and is going to his so his case is going through the court despite the fact that we've already proven that there is systemic racism and got the the director to publicly acknowledge yes we have a problem with systemic racism um still the courts uh found for CSIS in terms of the fact that you can't take these grievances outside despite documents showing that there's fear of reprisal and so on. So the law, I, I feel, you know, has, has so much more, um, so many, so many uh, changes that need to, to be made on, on that level, these settlements that are so problematic. And again, I signed the non-disclosure agreement, but I, I'm violating it every day. <laughs> Yeah, 
and 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 that's it and i'm you know like um i didn't know um professor reem about the civil disobedience <laughs> act that <laughs> that took place and but but that's what we need i think in this country and i think that comes out of patriotism it doesn't come out of you know wanting to be a rebel i think this is necessary and I wish and want to speak at universities and high schools to, to, to bring about that culture in Canada that doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist to the level that it should. And we need it uh, badly. And, and that and failure, our institutions failing us this way is, is just, it, it can't continue. It really can't. Thank you.